Good evening, everyone. I'm Steve Yanni, Superintendent of Schools, and it's our pleasure to welcome you to our virtual town hall this evening. We appreciate you giving your time this evening. Um, I wish this was a beautiful spring night, uh, but you know, dealing with some rain, at least we have uh, warmer temperatures. We have an agenda for this event that has been created by um, putting together messages that our leadership team wanted to share with our community and also uh, by looking at the questions that were pre-submitted for this uh, event. We gathered all of that information and put together an agenda that really is responsive to both the needs of our leadership team, but also the needs as evidenced by the questions submitted uh, by parents and guardians and families. There will also be some opportunities throughout the event to um, submit additional questions and have those answered. We'll be using the question and answer feature tonight and we'll track all of the questions that are being asked. We'll answer as many of the questions that are asked tonight as we can and any questions that we don't get to or we're not able to fully answer tonight, we will um, add to future communications. If there are any student specific questions that are asked tonight, a member of our leadership team will touch base with whoever asked that question because we're going to be speaking globally tonight and it wouldn't be appropriate in a setting like this to answer student specific questions about individual students. This virtual town hall is being recorded and in next week's Touch Base Tuesday, we will share the link um, to this recording as well as summary information, questions and answers and any other related information that uh, would be appropriate for our community to have. Tonight, we have a number of panelists. We have Mr. Dave Hoffman, our Chief Academic Officer, Ms. Meredith Penner, our Supervisor of Teaching and Learning, Dr. Rita Perez, our Director of Student Services, and Mr. Prakash Patel, our, our Director of Innovation and Technology. We're also joined by members of our Executive Leadership Team and our Building Principal Team. To get us started tonight, I'd like to talk about some information that we included in the Touch Base Tuesday yesterday. I'm sure everyone read the Touch Base Tuesday. I know, I know so many of you uh, sit right by your computer um, so that you can read it as soon as it comes out. Um, some of the information that I'm about to share will help frame additional information um, throughout the virtual town hall uh, this evening. First, I want to reiterate our district's commitment to, to equity. You will hear tonight in the virtual town hall Equity is a thread that runs through every discussion we have. Another thread that you will hear tonight is the idea of putting students in the driver's seat of their education. An example of this is how we've transformed the course placement process at the secondary level to a student uh, course selection process, really giving kids the opportunity to reflect on their own strengths and their interests and how they want to stretch themselves. So you'll hear a thread uh, of that this evening. You'll also be hearing about schedules that provide opportunities for students and te teachers to interact during the day beyond regular class periods. This is really important and we've heard over the last couple of years um, the need for and almost the demand for um, tutoring. And one of the things that we'll be talking about as we move forward with teaching and learning is really prioritizing standards and alleviating the need for tutoring, but providing time during the day so that all students have an opportunity to connect with their teachers to promote equity. Our school district will also be talking about school start times in the coming week. Since the uh, beginning of this year, we have engaged in and implemented later start times and uh, our leadership team is in the final stages of evaluating um, the pros and cons of those start times. So within the next couple of weeks, I expect uh, that our community will receive communication from our leadership team about our school start times. Tonight, you'll also hear several of our panelists talk about removing barriers, how we're removing barriers to upper level courses and more rigorous content. We want every student to be able to walk through every door educationally in Upper Dublin. We want kids to realize success not only K-12, but once they leave our K-12 setting. We're also engaged in an equity audit and we hope to have the first part of that equity audit completed by this summer. 
we're looking at um, how we are structuring our course selection process, our curriculum, how we are responding to students' needs, and really making sure that every student has every opportunity that they could possibly have afforded to them in the K-12 experience. And tonight we'll also focus on blended learning. And I'd like to uh, remind everyone that blended learning is not synonymous with a hybrid schedule and it's not synonymous with concurrent teaching. As a result of the pandemic this year, we've had to do widespread concurrent teaching. And those of you who have children uh, and family members at the secondary level know what concurrent teaching is. It's when the teacher is teaching groups of students in front of them and teaching a group of students virtually. Our intent and goal moving forward is not to have widespread uh, concurrent teaching. And also blended learning isn't about putting kids in front of screens. This year, we've had to do things a little bit differently because of health and safety protocols. But I think tonight, as we move through the uh, virtual town hall, you'll get a better idea of our district's vision and path forward in blended learning. Again, thank you so much for coming. And I'll turn uh, the floor over to Mr. Dave Hoffman, our Chief Academic Officer. Mr. Hoffman. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, as Dr. Ghani said, uh, teaching and learning and some of our other uh, team members are here tonight to talk to you a little bit about uh, teaching and learning in Upper Dublin. And uh, we wanted tonight to uh, feel a little different than the presentations that you've been seeing and hearing uh, over the past year. Um, for the past year, so much of our conversations about teaching and learning needed to be in the context of the pandemic. And so much of the good work that we were doing uh, leading up to March um, has had to shift. And we're looking forward to getting into September and continuing uh, a lot of our work so that you begin to see and understand uh, a little bit more about our vision for teaching and learning. So this evening, we're going to talk about uh, kind of where we were, are, and are going, and uh, the other topics that uh, Dr. Yanni uh, mentioned. As he did mention, the Q&A is open. We have members of, members of the leadership team um, that are uh, keeping track of those as they come. So if there are questions, please feel free to add those um, at any time. So there's a lot of dates here um, and a lot of information, uh, but we did receive a lot of questions about what have you learned uh, over the past year that you want to keep doing what did you learn over the last year that we want to avoid uh, moving into this? And so what we tried to do was uh, lay out a little bit of where we were as a teaching and learning department in August of 2019, uh, when this teaching and learning team uh, began working with our teachers. And it all comes back to our teachers and their uh, enthusiasm and willingness to learn uh, new ways of reaching all students. And so I won't go through each day, uh, each month rather, but I do want to highlight that when we kicked off the 2019-2020 school year, uh, we began and uh, each of these titles, I should say before I jump in, each of these titles are the professional learning days, the PD days for our, our teachers and educational uh, staff. So we began the year really focused on kids first beyond everything, put programs aside, put all the other drama aside. What do we need for kids to do right by kids first? You can't go wrong when we're thinking about those individual kids. And we talked a lot about creating what we were referring to as hashtag UD best day. So if you're on any social media, do a search for UD best day and you'll see some incredible things uh, over the past year and a half. But we started about making those days for kids where they were excited to talk about what they did when they got home. So hopefully when you asked your student, what did you do in school today? The answer wasn't nothing. Uh, but really on that first day of school, capturing their enthusiasm. So we talked about ways to engage all students. Through the course of the year, we were looking at student ownership, providing access to learning for all, not some. We were talking about the feedback process, how to communicate both between staff members, between students, and how then to apply all of those things that we've been working on. And in March, uh, March 9th, you see it circled on the calendar, we had a professional learning day where we kicked off our first ever March Madness, where our teachers were going to be applying all of their learning 
um, just like we would want students to apply their learning. The purpose of that application was going to help us understand where are our strengths, where are our needs to improve, and what are our next steps. So elementary um, families on the call tonight have heard those words with your progress reports. What am I currently doing? What am I not doing yet? What am I on the verge of doing? And what can I do now to get there? And so our teachers were gonna be looking at that process uh, in a com com competition uh, to kick off. And then at the end of that week, we know where uh, we went at that point. And so we've really worked um, to build uh, enthusiasm and focus back into what we were doing, to, to take a look at those August, January, February, March dates and say, how do we put this into action? And our teachers and our students rose to that challenge. Much of what we were hoping to do was accelerated. We had about 400 uh, staff members uh, signed up for March Madness. We had 100% of our staff members signed up on the 13th when things uh, you know, kicked into gear there. And so what we started to learn in March was by looking at our resources, we were able to get devices in every student's hand, K-12. We were able to use resources that we never knew we had before. We had just started talking about what Google Meet was and how we might wanna use it as a district. And immediately we started to see that we could interact with all of our staff. We could interact with our students. We can use it for community building. We can use it for uh, professional learning. And so, um, what we hope continues to happen is not that we're on devices all day, but that we have access to those devices to do things differently. In June, we really took, a, took time as a staff to focus on where were our strengths through that closure, that spring closure? How did we provide some meaningful instruction? How did we engage students? How did we provide feedback? And how can we build community in any environment. Because we knew going into the summer that it may not look the way that it looked in February and we had to be prepared for that. So our teachers talked with each other, they talked with their grade level partners, with the courses next to them to really focus on those essential learning standards. Our time in August, November and January has been about reinforcing blended learning. And we're gonna talk about that blended learning piece in just a few minutes, um, but really proud of our teachers and our students and our community um, for the work with blended learning and for allowing us to uh, have a little bit of time tonight to talk about what it is and what it isn't, um, knowing that once we eliminate some of those restrictions uh, in our classroom, uh, when we are able to eliminate some of that health and safety, uh, uh, not that health and safety is ever on the back burner, but some of those restrictions tied to health and safety, so that you can really start to see what we mean by blended learning. Uh, Mr. Patel, do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, summer 2021 and some vision for technology? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Um, I, I do wanna just uh, go back for a second to, to March and, and what that looked like uh, for us before I, I briefly talk about the summer plan. Um, one of the things that we wanted to ensure is, uh, is that the continuity in education for our students. And so uh, we, we work to reallocate um, a lot of our technology so that all of our students could have access to, to their teachers or coursework and so forth. So re reallocating the Chromebook so that we become a, a, K, a K through 12 one-to-one -one school. Um, and so the, the Chromebooks were repurposed, reallocated, given to the, the kindergarten to the fifth grade. Um, and that allowed us to then put in other systems in place such as Google Meet, Zoom, to allow our teachers to reach out to our students and, and lead instruction that way. Um, we also have the introduction of a lot of collaborative tools, um, changing our platform for some of our courses so that we become cloud-based um, and that removes some barriers that the kids would, uh, might've faced uh, having to learn from home, may not have the software that they need. So some of our uh, software went to the cloud, which, which made access to the coursework that much easier for our students. So the summertime, uh, we're looking at continuing with our refresh plan to ensure that our students have technology um, that, that is functional and that is gonna allow them to move forward um, and allow our teachers to have access to, to technology that's gonna support 
the way that they're using technology, having the demand of, of video conferencing um, to have a robust device is, is vital for, for them to continue to move forward. And I'm gonna turn, turn this over to Mrs. Penner. Thank you, Mr. Patel. Um, I'm gonna take the first question from the Q&A as sort of a kicking off point to this slide. And it was about, um, is blended learning basically online learning? Um, and that's a great segue to this conversation, which we've started in the summer and have been continuing all year. And I think that maybe um, because we started using the term blended learning a lot um, during school closure and throughout this period of virtual and concurrent teaching, um, that it's maybe misinterpreted as being synonymous with something that exists because of the pandemic or because we need to be online. Um, so I wanted to provide a little bit of clarity about blended learning. Um, and it's really um, centered around providing access and opportunity for, for students, knowing that not every student is ready to learn the same thing the same day or in the same way or in the same pace. So it's really about individualized path and pace and providing that choice for students. So when we work with our teachers, we're really working on having them choose instructional activities and instructional modalities um, intentionally to address the needs of all learners and also that match the, the content that they're choosing to teach. Um, it's really centered around student ownership, student goal setting, students being part of that learning process. So students understanding who they are as learners, what it is they're supposed to be learning and what they're responsible for as far as demonstrating mastery of those skills. So we want to sort of try to dispel some myths that still exist right now. It's not just mixing teaching and technology. I think you'll find that our teachers are leaning a little bit more heavily on technology right now to Mr. Hoffman's point because of some of those health and safety restrictions. Um, I think it's important to know that blended learning doesn't mean screen time and that I'd like to talk a little bit about screen time. I really feel strongly that all screen time is, is not created equal. So we know that we have screen time with our own families and our own social circles for a variety of reasons where there's a significant amount of live adult interaction on the screen. There's also passive screen time where kids are certainly just passively reading or passively watching. Um, there's also screen time where they're able to collaborate in groups on Google Docs or um, Google Slides with students that might be sitting six feet away from them or students that might be sitting in their home. So, Screen time in and of itself sometimes has a negative connotation, how many minutes a student is staring at a screen, but I think it's important to take apart what the screen time is intended for, why the teacher chose to use a digital media for that instructional and what the purpose was. And we encourage parents if there's ever a question about screen time or about why a lesson appears to be maybe more asynchronous than they feel is appropriate, please reach out to your teachers because um, I'm confident that our teachers are able to explain why they're making the choices that they're making and what the expectations are for students as they engage in blended learning. Um, next slide, Mr. Hoffman. Yeah, I would just, Ms. Penner, before we scoot ahead, want to give maybe two examples here to think about that, you know, when we talk about path and pace, um, I'm immediately as, an Eng as a former English teacher thinking about some of the lessons that I observed uh, or saw uh, in our classrooms this year. And thinking about 11th grade English right now, where they outlined the process for the writing that they were doing. But a student could spend, you know, one day if needed on the brainstorming and outlining stage. They could then move on uh, to, the pre to the, you know, paragraph development or the uh, topic sentence development. So in very traditional learning models, the teacher teaches outline to the whole class. The whole class does their outline. The whole class turns their outline in at the same time. The teacher grades those 30 to 150, however many um, outlines, returns those to the students, and then the students work on the next step. Blended learning allows a student who doesn't need as long to work on an outline, the opportunity to get feedback in class from the teacher, because the teacher is not standing and delivering, you know, a full 90 minute lesson. 
the students can get that information from the teacher, get the feedback from the teacher and move on to the next step and not worry about who has or hasn't moved on yet. So that differentiated path and pace, it doesn't mean that students get to choose not to write a paper. The pace is much more aligned to the individual student. The teacher can uh, refocus a goal for a certain student knowing, you know, last time they did a really nice outline, I wanna see them add citations and resources to their outline because that student is ready for that level of detail of an outline. So that's what blended learning helps us do. Meet the needs of all the students in the room where they are that day. Same thing for a math class. When a student is ready to enrich or understands a concept, they can move on to application. They don't have to sit and do like we used to do when I was in school, the same 20 problems with their whole class and tune out uh, for the second half because they know how to solve all the problems. Um, or be the kid that gets to go up to the board and write all of the problems because they know how to do them. Blended learning allows that individual to do something different with their learning that day. And that's really what we're excited about, but what you may not get to see because of the restrictions that are in place right now. Mr. Hoffman, there was a question that came into the, to the Q&A that said, isn't it impossible to meet the needs of each individual? So what I would say is, our teachers are very adept at grouping students together for instructional moments and, and instructional, whether it's mini lessons, acceleration, remediation, um, very well. And so it's, it's less about trying to do something for 22 individual students in a room and that teacher taking a look out across the class and saying, I have six kids that I need to work on this with, so I'm gonna pull them. So it's not impossible. I think our, I think our teachers are um, incredibly well-versed in doing that. And that's where the layering and the uh, stations start to lay on top of each other and then the flipped instruction. So what I saw from the 11th grade English, for example, was they were creating, they were recording the video that they would typically give the lecture, the short five or six minute lecture on outlining. So students could listen to that if they needed to listen twice, if they needed to listen three times, rewind and pause, they could. Um, so that frees up the teacher's time to go, as Dr. Yanni said, and work with the groups that they need to work with on that given day. So looking at what blended learning um, is helping us to do, it's supporting our goal of, per, of, of ensuring access, opportunity, and choice for our students. From an equity and an access perspective, Dr. Yanni talked a little bit about the course selection process. At our secondary level uh, this year, students completed um, reflections on themselves as learners in content areas. They use those uh, reflections to meet with each of their teachers to talk about what they believe of themselves as a learner in terms of selecting the appropriate courses uh, for next year. So some students, uh, you know, wanted to stretch a little bit. Some students realized where the stretch might be more successful or appropriate. And then our counselors uh, did a fantastic job talking to the student from the big picture to be able to say, so I know you're in the band and you have a job and you have four AP classes and two honors. Are we able to balance all of this? So we started to talk through some of that a little bit. Over the last two years, we've been looking at our program of studies to eliminate those artificial barriers um, that kept kids out of certain classes like prerequisites that um, we can address from a teaching and learning perspective. What I mean is, um, if a student didn't yet have um, Algebra 2 in preparation for a chemistry class, our teachers can ask themselves and their, uh, in their uh, teaching teams, what skills from Algebra 2 does this student need to be successful in chemistry? And how do I offer that skill as an instructional lesson in chemistry for those students. Um, I met with a senior last year who said, you know, Mr. Hoffman, my friend couldn't get into chemistry because he didn't have the math background. But to be honest with you, I was so far from algebra two by the time I took that class that I needed some refreshers. Um, and so our teachers do that. And so we recognized some of those barriers uh, were unnecessary, particularly as we look uh, at expanding blended learning. Um, Ms. Penner, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the transition uh, that we've done from five to six and the service delivery? Sure. 
So we're really looking um, as we transition students from fifth grade to sixth grade and, and getting ready for what those supports need to look like at their individual needs. So when we think about how we use our adult resources, how we use technology, how we use blended learning, really looking to so support them in the skills um, that they still demonstrate an area of need and what they need to learn next. Um, we met, Mr. Ortiz and I met this week with sixth grade staff members really talking about what they value as sixth grade teachers and really listening to their concerns and their um, excitement about welcoming in next year's sixth grade cohort of students and talking not about of, you know, what kids can't do, but really focusing on where are those kids now and where do we need to meet them in September? So looking at how we provide supports, um, our reading specialists are really focusing in on where the needs are and how they can support those kids. So less of a pullout model and really an integrated model of this is an English unit that's heavy in writing. We know kids often struggle with writing and the writing process. So how can we support them when the need exists and in what ways? Looking at special education supports and gifted supports in a similar way um, what do kids need and how can it be provided in more authentic settings? So we're really excited about the way that's allowing us to expand the resources and the supports for even more kids across settings. I think we've seen some real silver linings um, with the virtual options and Google Meets for kids to not have to physically leave or travel um, to jump in and get some support or some feedback um, from a different staff member. So that's been really exciting. But we'll be spending some time this June with staff members from fifth to sixth, eighth to ninth, and every grade level and course in between, really talking about where do kids land, what do they know, and what do we need to support in the fall? Um, and I would say, um, Ms. Penner, one of the things that we talked about at Ed Committee uh, last week was that students who may just need a, some additional support or may be ready for additional enrichment on a given day are now experiencing that in their classroom because our teachers are getting uh, the support from specialists, uh, which has been pretty uh, a nice a nice uh, perk of this blended learning. And I would say too, Mr. Hoffman, not just support from specialists, but just the modeling by those specialists Model. in the classroom, so that moving forward, you know, all staff members have the tools in front of them and, and watched examples of ways that they can in their own classrooms, you know, without another person in another room in another space um, within the four walls of the classroom, really provide those different levels of both support and enrichment. I think it's also important. I, you know, I, I, I don't think we can emphasize enough. I'm, I'm sorry for interjecting, but you know, when I think of the growth that we've seen um, among the adults in our system in terms of the agility and using technology um, and just rethinking how we use time, I don't think we can let this idea go that um, our teachers are really good at finding ways to meet the needs of kids. And so whether we're looking at schedules differently and freeing up some time, you know, to have office hours or we're leveraging technology for teachers and students to me to get extra assistance. I don't want this idea that, um, you know, it, this is this is impossible, you know, has it been a heavy lift through the pandemic? Yes, but I can tell you as superintendent. I'm incredibly proud of our teachers, you know, and I'm not saying that to pander to anyone. Those of you on the call that know me know I don't pander. I'm incredibly proud of our of our teachers for, you know, the growth and the exploration in in multiple areas, technology included, um, that we've seen this year and how they're leveraging that to meet the needs of kids. Um, Dr. Yanni, I couldn't agree more, and I'd love to take this opportunity to also address the the um, notion that you know um, this is impossible in terms of meeting the needs of all learners. Um, one of the things that we've discovered during um, this time in the pandemic is that students that we thought would um, really have difficulty with the blended learning um, approach of learning have really bloomed and blossomed with this and have gained a sense of independence um, and have really um, been able to show their, their skills. Another piece that we've learned is that, <coughs> excuse me, um, universal design for learning, which is a concept that grew out of architecture and product development and has now transferred into education is something that um, our teachers are probably already doing and don't really even know it as a result of blended learning. But UDL, as we call it, is really an approach that helps us. It's a very proactive approach 
and it helps us to really meet the broad scope of learning needs for all learners. So if you think about universal design in our everyday world, we, we have the cutouts in the sidewalks, we have ramps, we have elevators, we have closed captioning. Those weren't designed necessarily for us to use, but boy, do they come in handy when we have um, that, heavy, that heavy load to take into a building and we can use the ramp or the elevator, or uh, perhaps we're um, uh, watching TV and uh, the folks with us are sleeping and we don't want to wake them up, we can turn on closed captioning and we can uh, watch, watch that movie or watch that show and, and read along with that captioning. In the classroom, that looks like students um, receiving that information in multiple ways, but they don't have to receive it in all of those multiple ways. They access what they need. So if you know, um, um, teacher, if we're in an English class and we're studying a certain piece of literature and it's available in a synopsis as a short movie, a student can watch that prior to engaging with the text to get some background knowledge, to get an understanding of what it is because that's how they learn best. Somebody could listen to a podcast on a scientific principle um, before heading into biology class to learn about it and have some information. That's a little bit of a flipped classroom, but it's also another way that we approach universal design for students. Um, another aspect of universal design is an engagement in as, and as an assessment and how students show what they know. They can show what they know in multiple different ways if we provide them those opportunities. And I'm really proud of the uh, very small pilot we have going at our high school. Um, we're working through a grant through Patan. Um, and uh, the teachers are really um, taking to it. We attended our third session today. It was really great. But speaking of all of that, I think one of the things that we've learned also as we work through this blended learning process is that what we've allowed our students to do is really gain some of those 21st century college and career readiness skills. We live in an information economy. So knowing wrote facts like we needed to know and were taught to do when we went to school is really not what it is that our students need to have as they move into college and career. They need to be able to really think critically about problems, be creative, work in teams, collaborate, um, work across multiple media, um, learn about ever-changing technologies, um, deal with the flood of information. How do I look at all this information and know what is true and accurate? Um, uh, and students need to be able to change with lot rapidly changing conditions. And we certainly know that um, many of them did quite well with that. Um, and um, are learning the importance of being flexible um, and taking initiative and leading and being purposeful with their learning. So this, you know, this opportunity during this pandemic really allowed us to really open more doors towards equity access and build 21st century um, college and career readiness skills. Dr. Perez. Um, just talking a little bit more about the other bullets on this slide, it's, it's really been great to watch kids be more um, involved in the learning process. So when we talk about metacognition, we're really talking about um, a person's awareness of their own learning process. Um, some people will define metacognition as thinking about thinking. So being a parent of an eighth grader uh, here in Upper Dublin, it's been really interesting for me to watch this from both sides of the fence, from my, my office here at the administrative building and also from my home um, watching my 14 year old um, participate in her virtual experience and I think to Dr. Perez's point what we're preparing kids for as I look to those eighth graders going into the high school they have spent a year this year really navigating a lot more independently um, our learning management system Schoology they've been accessing teachers during office hours they've really been advocating when they need help checking their grades um, asking for feedback um, working collaboratively with colleagues, with their peers um, in Google Meets and Google Classrooms, being more responsible digital citizens, um, because we've all had to have basically our whole lives exposed to virtually um, for the last 12 months in some capacity. Um, and I think it's really been interesting to watch the way uh, my own child is just setting timers, being more independent, being organized and self-sufficient. And I think we are going to see um, a population of kids that are resilient 
um, that have had to be disappointed, that have had so many unexpected, unpredictable changes that usually as parents, we try to protect our, our children from. Um, we try to prevent as many of those uncomfortable experiences as possible because that's what our job is or what we like to think it is sometimes. And I think there will be a lot more growth in the way kids um, thrive and as a result of this. So the metacognitive process in the classroom really is students having a better understanding of what it is they're learning that day, how they're engaging in that learning and what their teacher expects them to demonstrate as the mastery of those skills. Um, so it's not, I think to one of the questions earlier, how impossible it must be to think about it. You know, we're not asking teachers to teach this the way they did before through a computer and then overlay blended learning. We're really asking teachers to stop and think differently about the standards and how the students in front of them can address, they can address those standards and master those skills. So it might be that I give a formative assessment at the beginning of a class and recognize that two thirds of my class have mastered the skill that I was planning to teach that day. And then I adjust and fill in the gaps for the students who might need it and push those two thirds forward. So really asking teachers to look at their lesson plans a little bit differently and really plan their instruction for that face-to-face -face or even synchronous on the computer time with kids to give meaningful feedback um, that, students, that students need when they need it. So I'm gonna have Mr. Hoffman talk a little bit more about feedback as we look at feedback for learning, as learning and of learning. Yeah, I won't say much uh, more, Ms. Benner, because I, I, I thought that was a good place where you ended it. Um, but when we look at what students are doing, those traditional quizzes and tests may just look different. And when you, you know, when we have our vocabulary test on Fridays, I might have known I got 100%. I knew them all by defining them. I might have got a 50%, which told me I didn't know them. Um, if I took the unit one test and I got an 80, I knew that I got a B. But what did I do with that 80%? I don't have an answer for that as a student. When I think about what I did with my students when I was in the classroom, knowing that everybody got an 80% on a test or the class average was uh, an 88% on that assessment, that didn't tell me what each individual student needed. And so when we look at this last slide, rather than it saying assessment for, as, or of, we're talking about feedback here. Ms. Penner talked about what that learning objective was. That feedback for learning being now I know that I, I as a student know what I need to do with these problems today or I as a teacher know what uh, I need to do with grouping my students today. The feedback as learning is what that student takes away. So telling me I got an 80 doesn't tell me what I need to do to learn better. Telling me that um, you know, your, you know what the definitions mean, but you need to work on the application of them in terms of how they function in the cell. That might be feedback as learning. So I can take that and work on that specific feedback in preparation for that feedback of learning. So I put all of it together in some sort of an end product that could be an assessment, could be a writing assignment, could be a project, could be a presentation but I put all of that feedback for and as learning into something that allows me to demonstrate my learning and allows the teacher to give me feedback on my learning, not on just those you know, 10 definitions or those 30 pages out of the book. Mr. Hoffman, one of the things we didn't connect as clearly, but that I'd like to just draw the connection to is when a student, just like an adult, is part of choosing what they're going to be doing and how they're going to be doing it and setting those goals when we're part of that as adults or part of that as students we're naturally more intrinsically motivated and more engaged in the learning process so when you're not just told what to do and how to do it but truly part of that um, that planning process and that goal setting i think we see students be you know significantly more engaged and motivated as that English guy, I have to hold up a book. Uh, <laughs> um, many of our teachers right now and administrators, uh, and we, we just got our, our shipment in, so many more are going to be reading it. It's a new book that just came out called Giving Students a Say, and it's how we engage students and give them a voice in their assessment um, and in their learning process. Because typically, you know, a student has a say up until that, you know, time for that paper pencil assessment where now their voice is silenced and 
they're waiting to see when that paper or when that uh, test comes back, what my, what my score says. And so this book that we're gonna be engaging in some discussions around, uh, again, called Giving Students a Say, uh, ties directly to that. Ms. Penner, you walked me right into a book promo, sorry. Um, so some of the other questions, this isn't a great transition, it's abrupt, um, but we wanna make sure we save time for a few questions at the end. A few other questions that came up was, so what's up with Cardinal Academy next year? Um, will we have Cardinal Academy next year? Is it going to look the way that it looks this year? And just as we began uh, the presentation today uh, by looking back first, I wanna share back a little bit. So the summer that um, I came on board in Upper Dublin, the leadership team began to have some very preliminary conversations uh, that most districts that I know have had or were having. Um, and that's about identifying some virtual option for students. Now, I don't mean in, you know, that your entire experience is going to be a virtual experience. Some schools have that option, some don't. But we started to have some uh, preliminary conversations about virtual options in Upper Dublin because, as you know, we have a number of students that want acceleration over the summer. Um, we have students that, for a variety of reasons, may have extended absences or a homebound uh, um, situation that requires them to be out of our building for several months. Um, in previous districts, and I believe it's probably the case here as well, sometimes there's a course conflict. So I'm in band and I wanna take this class that there's only one, or I go to Eastern, so I can't take the AP French class or whatever it might be, um, that a virtual option that is um, housed by the district um, is a preferred option because um, many of you may know that we use MVP. Um, other districts have Edgeseer or other online programs. And while they're good programs and they're vetted programs, nothing substitutes the uh, curriculum and instruction, the teaching and learning that our Upper Dublin teachers and uh, district can provide. And so we started again, like in early 2019, mid 2019, having some conversations about what different modules might look like. So if I know one of my algebra two students are going to be out for six or seven weeks, rather than trying to find some other option for them, we could have an option where they could do some of that work virtually on their own by watching some videos, by engaging with a, with a peer or a colleague or a teacher uh, on that learning, having some availability of office hours. We started to brainstorm some of that. Then rewinding back to that timeline at the beginning, March uh, 2020 accelerated everything. And so what we ultimately had to do was set our initial planning for a virtual option aside and try to replicate what we were doing in our buildings virtually. And what we did uh, with Cardinal Academy this year was establish something that allowed flexibility for our families. Um, if someone had to quarantine, if a situation wouldn't allow students to enter a building for a couple months because of a family situation, but then they were able to or the opposite, a student was in our building, but then needed to uh, become virtual uh, for an indefinite period of time or a short period of time. Our virtual option of Cardinal Academy this year allowed that flexibility. So we're proud that we had something that allowed those students to continue. We weren't a district that just then resulted in, you know, students having to do asynchronous work independently or students having to, um, you know, just miss some of that learning uh, that, that is so important, particularly now. And so the Cardinal Academy this year allowed us to do that. We've had a lot of questions from parents, teachers, and community members about what does Cardinal Academy look like for 2021-2022 school year. And what we can say at this point, um, and Dr. Yanni mentioned this early on, is that our hope is to limit um, or eliminate, uh, if possible, any concurrent uh, teaching. Um, that's not our preferred model. It was not our preferred 
um, model going into Cardinal Academy. But again, it worked this year for us for that flexibility piece. We will be surveying our families late April and early May to determine is there interest or need for a virtual option for next school year. We need to gauge our families and our family situations uh, to see what the needs may look like. We'll then, once we have that number, make some preliminary plans. We'll share that uh, in communication that they are initial plans. And then we'll start to look at what that looks like for individual grades and courses. We'll then circle back to those families uh, later in the summer to firm up um, that decision, and then we can plan. 2021, as we said in 2022, is going to be a very different virtual option. And then that first bullet about having a virtual option, our initial goal that we had been talking about uh, before all of this happened, that's on pause right now. We're learning a lot. I think through this year and next, we'll have a lot of modules that we can use and a lot of uh, uh, good videos, instructional resources that we've created. Um, and then later next year, we can start to plan out uh, more um, strategically and uh, clearly what that virtual option for the future looks like. Dr. Yanni, do you have anything you'd wanna add there? No, I. other than the fact that I wanna really reiterate something that you said, concurrent teaching was our reality this year because it had to be our reality this year. And when I said it had to be our reality, it's for the reason that you mentioned, it provided flexibility, um, particularly at the secondary level so that kids were not re-rostered into other sections and, and other teams and whatnot. But you know, our goal, unless there are, there's uh, you know, a, a special circumstance is to not have that, that same situation again next year. Again, not because teachers can't handle it, but what we don't want to do is have ask our teachers to split their focus, right? So um, we'll be working. And when Mr. Hoffman says, you know, we're, we'll survey to see what the needs are and then we'll plan, we'll actually sit with our, with our high school administration and middle school administration and look course by course. Um, and if a teacher has to have some virtual students, perhaps um, they will have a, a virtual period on their schedule. So um, we will uh, utilize our Touch Base Tuesdays to keep the community and you know, families you know, abreast of that, but we don't expect our, our virtual option to look like it looks this year, uh, how it looks this year to look next year. This slide, uh, this presentation rather, will be um, shared. There's that book actually. Um, this slide presentation and the recording of this, as Dr. Yoni said, will be um, updated and posted to our website, but we did want to include some of the resources that our teachers have been engaged in and that we've been using to guide uh, our work this year. Uh, Ms. Penner, I can't see if there are any question answers or Q&A. Not right now. So that concludes the formal portion of the presentation. If anybody would like to submit questions through the Q&A, we have a few minutes left. Well, we're waiting for people to uh, put some questions in um, the Q&A. I do want to thank um, the, the number of folks that attended uh, this evening uh, to hear a little bit more about our vision moving forward. Um, I also want to thank our students and our staff for doing everything they're doing to remain compliant with our health and safety protocols. Um, it's really important to us that we maintain our five day a week uh, in-person learning at the secondary level. Um, and that has really been made possible in large part by the number of, um, you know, number of families that have opted to stay, to stay virtual. So we're really grateful to everyone and how we can provide um, that continuum. Dr. Gani, I would just add, um, and we'll continue to reiterate this over ed committees, legislative meetings and communication, um, but there's, there's going to be a lot of conversation uh, there already has been using the phrase learning loss. And as you know, we've presented uh, data that we've been gathering over the course of the year. Um, our teachers uh, have a, a clear understanding of what our students know and can do. And those numbers may look different this year because the tasks look very different this year. Mm -hmm. uh, but as Ms. Penner pointed out, 
uh, at the data presentation, we have good evidence of our, of our students who are learning to read and reading to learn. We have good information about our students from math. Our teachers are doing a great job collaborating with one another. Dr. Yanni often references the five in, five out in terms of skills and standards that students need when they come into a course and when they leave a course. And so while there will be a lot of conversations nationally and internationally likely about learning loss, uh, we're asking uh, that we uh, recognize that it's unfinished learning at this point. It's unfinished learning. We're not finished with uh, what we're doing with our students. And our teachers will recognize that. Our teachers will work in new ways uh, to meet the needs of students. And our students will uh, be able to articulate and identify that as well. So um, that's a phrase you'll hear us saying. I, I was just buffering a little bit if there were any other questions. Yeah, some, some questions came in. Uh, the question, why even offer the Cardinal Academy? I'm worried for honors classes at the high school. It's not fair to teachers to have to teach. Um, concurrently. Um, we're not going to be focusing on teaching concurrently. Um, we have about 60% um, of our students at the high school and 40% of our students still virtual, about 80-20 split at the middle school and across our elementary schools about 82 or 83-17 is the split there. Um, we know we still have may have some families next year that are not comfortable coming back due to either someone being ill in the home or some extenuating circumstances. So um, we are gonna do everything we can so that concurrent teaching isn't a reality um, next year. And if there are those unique circumstances, we will alert you know, students and families that the class is going to be taught concurrently. Uh, we shared the percentage of kids in the Cardinal Academy. Um, will the PSSA scores give any um, info on learning loss? Um, I'm not sure that the PSSAs will, um, and here's why. Um, there, um, we are, we've already received a large number, a large percentage of uh, families opting out of um, having their students take the PSSA. So um, we will look at the scores and where we see some deficits or where we see um, some potential holes in our curriculum, but I don't think this year's scores are going to be representative of our entire student body because we won't have a, you know, it remains to be seen how many and what percentage of our students actually take the assessments. Um, the PSSAs are really what we call, for lack of a better phrase, an autopsy. They're assessments at the end of everything where we look um, and we see where holes in our curriculum um, where, where holes in our curriculum uh, might lie. So um, there will be much more information. Um, we don't even know when we're going to get the scores back from the PSSA. Some schools are not giving them until September of next year. So um, we will keep the community informed when we get those scores back and what they might reveal to us. We always do a presentation on our education committee, um, but it'll be to, to be determined if um, they really provide any real data on uh, whether there's learning loss or not. There's a question, do we have any insight uh, if the COVID restrictions will be lifted in the classroom for next year or if we'll be sticking to current policies? Um, we remain in contact with the Pennsylvania Department of Health as well as the Montgomery County Office of Public Health. Um, there is no indication right now um, that anything is changing. However, things change by the moment. Um, and one of the reasons we're going to maintain uh, publishing the Touch Base Tuesday every week is so that we can communicate timely with our families as things change. Um, if the emergency declaration uh, for the pandemic is lifted this, uh, this summer, I do anticipate that we will see some changes um, at the state and county level. We've seen travel restrictions be lifted. We've seen changes with, um, with um, the amount of time someone has to quarantine if they've been vaccinated. So I do anticipate some changes. It would just be premature for us to opine on what they are um, right now. There was a question, would the Keystones, um, would the Keystones uh, scores be um, able to be looked at to determine if there's any learning loss? 
The keystones do seem to be uh, better representative of the content that's actually taught uh, in courses. So I would anticipate that our keystone scores uh, will probably get some better data from our um, from our keystones. Um, the other, there's another question. Is there any planning going on now in the unfortunate event that the new variants take root locally? Will the district do what was done this year again, or would there be changes? Um, in that unfortunate event, which I, I think collectively we hope uh, that doesn't happen, um, if we would have to have some widespread uh, virtual teaching and learning happening, I do anticipate that you would see some changes over this year's model for sure. Um, there was also just a comment thanking um, everyone for uh, their preparation and, and sharing the information this evening. As we close out um, our time together tonight, again, thank you all for coming. Um, we know it's not easy to give up an evening for an event like this. And um, one of the things that, I, that I'm deeply appreciative in our community is that there are so many interested people in what we're doing, um, you know, in what, in what we're doing um, for students, whether that's removing barriers or figuring out how to teach uh, in a pandemic. We've moved a lot. Um, as a district. So for example, you know, we've, we talked earlier about changing the way we, we have students select courses and not using high stakes assessments um, to place students. Um, you're going to be hearing a lot more about our equity work in the coming weeks and we'll leverage our Touch Base Tuesday to share that information. And um, as we move towards the end of the school year, if we need to communicate even more beyond that touch base Tuesday. If things change at the state or county level, we'll be sure to do that um, as quickly as possible so that our entire community is kept uh, in the loop with, with what's going on. I thank all the panelists, I thank all the attendees, and I wish everyone a great evening. Thank you all. Good night, everyone.